Good afternoon. I think we'll uh, get started. Uh, welcome. And it's my pleasure to introduce Mary Beth Rawson, who uh, we've known for a long, long time. Uh, and I discovered an amazing coincidence just a few minutes ago that Jack Carroll and Mary Beth were married the same year that Judy and I were married. Oh, and that, very good all, all, but but that, that, that doesn't mean that we're all the same age. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does not mean that at all. Um, and also, that, you know, we it turns out the field of human interaction has many couples in it. We used to actually have an organization called Kuiples, where at the annual conference we'd have a dinner with all the different HCI couples because there are just so many of us in the field. It must be something about either us or the field that brings us together in this way. Um, Mary Beth has been a pioneer in the field of HCI uh, for a long, long time, done a lot of work over the years on a number of different interesting topics, uh, published a book with Jack on usability engineering, which is a very important and uh, well-cited book, and uh, has worked in a number of different areas. Um, and uh, she's going to talk to us today about a, a topic I didn't know she was working on either, uh, <laughs> mainly uh, the issue about adolescents who are online and whether that's a, a, a risk or a hazard or something that can be positive, and we'll find out from her exactly what, um, what the story is. So very good. Yes, thank you. All right, well thank you so much for uh, inviting me here and uh, also thanks to everybody who has uh, set aside some time to meet with us. We've just had a wonderful time getting to know some of the faculty again or for the first time and some of the students, so it's just been wonderful. And, and Gary's right uh, that a lot of people might not know that I've worked on this project because I've worked on so many different things. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is is a project that I've been working on as part of a team for the last five years or so. And so it's a fairly, you know, uh, complicated project in the sense of a lot of different things. And I'm not going to be able to share everything, partly because it's still ongoing, right? There's a lot of data that may never be analyzed. But, you know, we have a lot of data that we're, we will continue to work on um, over the years. And what I'm going to do is just try to tell you a little bit about um, the, the stuff that we've done thus far. All right, so um, I probably don't need to do a lot in the way of motivating this problem. Um, probably some of you out there have teens, um, and you know that uh, there is a big wild world out there, but we're going to start by kind of motivating the, um, the problem for why we would be studying adolescent safety online. And then I'm going to uh, share with you the um, sort of conceptual framework that we developed to guide this work, which is a developmental perspective, and then um, talk you through some of the, the studies that we did, um, all sort of leading towards this developmental view of ad adolescents as they do things online. Um, I'll be talking about why we want to think about this, not just as adolescents, but taking a kind of family systems perspective. Um, and then I'll be sharing the results of some studies. Uh, the first study that we did, just to kind of lay some groundwork, was an uh, was interview study of parents and their teens, or teens and their parents. And, um, and then we started doing bigger analyses using a uh, kind of a, uh, opportunistically in a way, a, very useful uh, data set that had been gathered by Pew. Um, and then since then, we have been developing our own surveys as part, and, and also, uh, well, we've conducted but haven't fully analyzed a um, fairly complex diary study gathering uh, kind of journal reports from teens and their parent um, over, a, over an eight-week period. So those are the kinds of things that we've been doing um, and they're all sort of pointing in this direction of teens doing things online that are, have these developmental impacts on them with respect to their safety. And so we'll talk about that and then just briefly sum up at the end um, what we might do about the kinds of things we're learning. All right. So um, the current landscape starts with, you know, sort of the ubiquitous connectivity. Um, and it's not just us who have the ubiquitous connectivity, but teens do. 
um, everything from uh, chat rooms or chat <coughs> spaces that are perhaps customized for teens, but maybe not. Uh, maybe chat that are really intended for other kinds of people that they easily can visit. Um, to uh, all kinds of opportunities for sharing, you know, whether it's YouTube videos or uh, you know Snapchat or all the all the kinds of things that we know teens are living with and loving to do, um, and it takes up a lot of their time. Um, even just something, you know, staying up with interests like Pinterest or other other sorts of um, posting sites like that, and of course there. Are, are the uh, games, you know, role-playing games, virtual worlds, whatever, where anybody, including a teen, can uh, get into Second Life or whatever and, and experiment with all kinds of things. So, if, you know, in principle, this is not a bad thing, right? It's not a bad thing, um, but um, there are some concerns that have been raised by a lot of people. This is just, uh, you know, from the Pew, um, survey just kind of characterizing where we are as of a few years ago. It's, I'm sure it's even, the numbers are probably even higher now. Um, almost all teens are online. Most of them have computers at home and a lot of them have, have smartphones. Um, many, a, a big majority are using um, social media of one sort or another. For example, Facebook. Um, and they, if you ask them, are you worried about your privacy online, for example, a lot of them are saying, no, I'm not really worried. I'm not really worried. Um, many of them post personal, you know, not just their name and that kind of stuff, but photos like we saw in the, those images before. Um, and in this same survey, which was of teens and their parents, um, 81% of the parents are concerned, right? So you sort of have the teens over here who are having fun doing all this stuff and are saying, you know, I'm, I'm not really that concerned about it. And then you have the parents over here who are saying, I'm feeling concerned, I'm feeling concerned. And so all of this has, has led to, why did that happen? <laughs> it's, it's Microsoft. <laughs> Ignore. Yes, yes, ignore. Let's try this again. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, so just to just to kind of finish this sort of setup. Um, so there's lots of fun stuff to do online, and you know if I'm a parent, I don't want to deny that to my child, right? You know, my child would revolt. If I said, no, not online for you. <laughs> but so, of course, we want children to be online. And this is a big way for them now to be in touch with their peers and learning about stuff and so on and so forth. At the same time, there's been a lot of concern about some of the risks that might um, come out of spending so much time online, um, whether it's more in the sort of the privacy domain, for example, unintentionally or intentionally disclosing personal information that may be actually sensitive, right? So just putting information out there that really shouldn't be out there for other people <coughs> to use. Um, or some of these other more behavioral things like uh, being bullied or harassed um, by uh, known or unknown other people, strangers. Or even the more, you know, sort of obvious, uh, you know, X-rated content that is so available to anybody who really takes much trouble to look for it. But in, in the case of teens, often arrives unrequested. You know, here, look at this, and it shows up in your email as an attachment, or it's on a page in uh, some social site that you go to. So these are the these are the worries that lead that led us and lead others to say, what about uh, adolescent online behavior? And the, are they making safe choices? And if they're not, are there things that could be done to try to help them be more safe and, and experience less of uh, negative outcomes from this? So 
um, just briefly, um, of course, other people have been working in this area. A lot of work on privacy has focused on adults, but some has looked at uh, online privacy. Some has looked at adolescents. Um, but most of the work when it comes to teens and their behavior online has come out of this worry, this overarching worry that teens are, you know, being assaulted somehow with uh, content that they shouldn't see or people are harassing them or bullying them or whatever. We need to protect them. So most of the studies that you find out there are, have this kind of protection um, focus or, or goal towards them. Um, what can we do to reduce the amount of risky stuff that the teens encounter? And, and while this is perfectly reasonable and, and very natural, especially if you talk to parents and so on, that, they, that that might be what they want to do, it turns out it's not that realistic or feasible because you, literally, you can't really put yourself into every online situation. It's so ubiquitous, right? So you can't really be totally preventative. And even if you could, even if you could, you're, you're missing out on the upside, right? You're missing out on the upside of all of these potentially risky situations. <coughs> and the upside is that I'm a teen, I experience something, and I do something to either remove myself from the situation or to confront a person or, you know, I basically learn to do something. Or maybe I don't and I have a really bad experience, but the next time I've learned my lesson. Right? So that's this sort of developmental side of online risk that we wanted to explore in our project. And that the, the, the beauty of saying, let's look at the upside of online risk is that if we can think about ways to talk about that and assess it and measure it and so on, it may be a, you know, sort of a way of thinking about how teens prepare themselves for you know, lifelong play and work in online spaces where they will be. Because they're not going to be teens forever. They're going to be adults and they're going to be doing what everybody else is doing. And they need to be fully functioning, you know, confident adults as they go out to do that. So that is the, like the, the long-term goal of work like this. So, so we start with a um, sort of a uh, premise that risk-taking and associated experiential learning are actually necessary for normal adolescent growth, right? It's not that we want to you know, <coughs> shelter the adolescents totally, you know, I'm not saying all together, but I'm going to show, show them totally, we want them to be exposed to some things that they need to work through. Um, and that if you are taking sort of a, you know, risk factor outcome view of this, which a lot of people studying, um, you know, privacy and online, online privacy and risk and so on have done, you would find, or you would expect to find, in this developmental view, that these factors and their impacts vary with a function of the team's maturity, you know, growth, right? So that it needs to be studied, you know, as a function of development, as well as studied as a developmental process, meaning you're transforming as you go. So, um, so what this suggested to us, and what we proposed in this uh, the grant that was funded was to take this family systems approach, meaning that we were going to study teens and their, uh, their parent together, right? Because uh, teen adolescent development takes place not just in the individual, but in the context of the family and friends and, and uh, the context that uh, the teen is, is growing up in. And so this this kind of view is, is not uncommon in family development, but it hadn't been, to our knowledge, and it hadn't been applied to the study of um, online safety and, and behavior. So, so that's what we chose to do. And so this, as I said, took place over a few years. 
And I'm just going to give you kind of an overview of some of the pieces of the project that I'm going to then uh, delve into. Um, so we began, as I mentioned earlier, with a, uh, an interview study, a simple interview study of teens and their parent. Um, and I'll be talking about that, but what one of the things that we did with that interview was take a cognitive moral development theory of, of Kohlberg um, and use that as a way to uh, make sense of the kinds of statements that teens were making about various kinds of online scenarios. Um, and we also uh, looked at the indicators of parenting style and tried to kind of circumlocute those things together. Um, now, one thing that this did was it provided, you know, s some, you know, kind of a story, uh, a bit of a story about this developmental view, but it also uh, set us up for this more in-depth, much more difficult study to do, which was um, a diary study of teen and parent. So it was a diary study, and it was a prompted diary study. So once a week, the participants would write, uh, they would respond to questions, and they would report any kind of risk events. So we had to find various kinds of risk <coughs> events, and they would say if one of those had happened, and then if so, they would respond to some questions about it. And we got these paired uh, reports from teens and their parents. Now this was a very challenging study to set up, to IR, you know, get an IRB for, you can imagine getting an IRB for something like that where they're reporting, you know, sexual predation or whatever. We had to, it took us over a year just to get the IRB working. So while we were doing that, um, sort of, we ran across, conveniently, this uh, Pew uh, Foundation survey. And this survey was also of teens and their parents. So that was really great for us because it meant we had that dyadic uh, unit to look at. And so we dove into that and uh, did some analyses of that. Now, it was also challenging in its own way because this is a typical Pew survey. It was pretty broad, asked a lot of stuff, but pretty shallow. You know, it was a lot of yes, no questions. So we had to come up with ways to, you know, kind of mine information out of that. So that took us a while, too. Um, meanwhile, um, as part of the diary study, we were developing some, our own survey uh, instrument to use as a kind of post-test, I mean, pre-test, post-test. And as part of that, we were also developing a survey that was going to be administered to a kind of a nationally representative sample. And we did eventually carry that out, but that is still ongoing, and, and uh, I won't be able to give you any results from that. So that shows you sort of the, the bits and pieces of the, the project as it uh, took place over a period of several years. And now I'm going to jump into just a uh, kind of a a quick dive into some of these projects that we did so you can <coughs> see some of the insights that we got from the data and how we were weaving them together into our overall story of this developmental process. So the interview study, this was um, done in the central Pennsylvania area. Um, we recruited, you know, flyers to the town and so on. Um, and ended up with 12 dyads. They were um, a mix of girls and boys. Um, most of the parents were moms. So there were 12 parents and 11 of them were moms. So, so it's not you know, exactly a uh, you know, balanced sample, but it's okay because it was our first uh, you know, exploration into this thing. And so we did these interviews, so they'd come in and one interviewer would talk to the parent and one would talk to the teen and we asked them slightly different questions. The teen, we were interested, you know, what do you do online and so on, just to get a sense of what their online uh, activity would be like, was like. But we also then, because we were interested in this kind of, remember I, I mentioned the, this moral development framework. So we were interested in this notion that kids at, at different ages 
have different moral sensibilities about what is good and bad, right? And so we ask them to comment on some of these sorts of risky uh, situations online, or perhaps unethical situations online, things like you know, um, da illegally downloading uh, media, or uh, cyberbullying, or um, you know, sending pornography to somebody. So we would ask them to comment on these things. And we then ended up with a bunch of statements, um, which we coded according to these st this stage view of moral development. And Kohlberg's stages are these six things, so one, two, three, four, five, six. And they go from kind of a, you know, the lowest level, which is I do whatever I need to do so that I won't be punished, you know, sort of like a small child might behave to one that is, you know, kind of, uh, the second stage is, it, I call it personal hedonism, but it's basically, it's all about me, it's all about me. So whatever is good for me is how the way it should be, right? And so decisions are made purely cost and benefit for me, me, me. Um, and then you start getting a little bit more into the social realm, um, you know, good boy approval seeking, you know, basically trying to please somebody. Um, and then moving more into kind of codified or um, externalized uh, rule systems and so on. So uh, there's an authority and you have duty to that respected authority, or perhaps there are rules that have been agreed on, like law. Right. Uh, so the fact that downloading music is illegal, that should count for something if you're operating on the basis of that kind of principle. And then the highest level is you're kind of beyond, above the law. Right. We, we laugh when we say above the law, but you're above the law because you have internalized what you know is, is to be right or wrong. So you have your own personal ethical sense that you can actually take up against the law because you feel strongly in some cases. So those are the, the, the stages that Colbert uh, defined and we use them as a coding scheme. Um, and then we coded parents' interviews as well, but in the case of parents, we were interested in how they were relating to their kids. And so the questions we asked them was, you know, what did you know about what your kids are, what do you know about what your kids are doing online? What sorts of things, how do you respond when they do these things? What sorts of things do you do to, you know, control them, if at all? Do you use technologies and so on? So those are the kinds of questions we asked them. And their um, responses were coded according to this uh, very well-regarded uh, parenting style um, framework by, um, I think it's Diana Bomerin, um, uh, which uses these concepts of demandingness and responsiveness. So, so demandingness is basically saying, uh, I know what you need to do, and you know, I'm going to you know, convey that. Right? So I have high expectations. I, I expect you to behave in a certain way. And responsiveness is being very supportive and nurturing and saying, you know, I love you and I understand who you are and I empathize with you. So it's these two sides of the parent thing. It's not like good parent, bad parent, because the notion is that everybody has some of both, right? And the question is, how much do you have of each? And then that defines your parenting style, which in this case, in her, in her framework, is four different things. You're either authoritative, that's where you are high in both dimensions. So yes, I have a very clear set of expectations, but yes, boy, do I understand where you're coming from, right? So that's the authoritative parent. And then the authoritarian parent is the high-low. You do what I tell you to. <laughs> and indulgent is low-high. You do whatever you want. And then neglectful is low-low. So that's, that was how we dealt with the data. And then how did we summarize it? Well, uh, Pam Wisniewski, who's the postdoc who was leading this project, came up with this very uh, 
clever thing, which of course we then used it in the title for the fable called Moral Compass. So this is, uh, this is graphing for individual teens in this case according to the proportion of their comments that were coded at any one of those six stages. And we looked at it across, we only had 12 kids, so we didn't have a whole lot to work with, but we looked at it across these um, age groupings, and what we found was that, sure enough, there was some indication of this developmental progress. That is, as you looked at the older teens, they were starting to express um, statements, moral judgments, at these higher levels. Okay, so that would have made Colbert happy, I guess. Um, and, and yet, you know, they're cl it's clearly, you know, individualized. Like, here's the 16 and 17 year olds, and here's somebody in this, this was the personal hedonism stage. And, you know, so this is a 17 year old, very much, I will do what I do. You know, I will do what I would do. Wild boy. And so we did see some evidence, you know, again, hand waving because it's a very small set, but there did seem to be a tendency for uh, gender to be playing a role here, that the girls of the same age tended to be further along, in the, at least in the kinds of statements that they made. We also saw, you know, from a qualitative perspective, that there was often uh, a kind of a critical incident, you know, where as part of their, their story that they would tell us, we would hear about something that happened in their life, a friend who had had a really bad thing happen to them, or even a family member, and then that became part of their rationale for why they would behave this way in the future. So again, that sort of goes with this, uh, it's consistent with this view of uh, developing a sensibility about online safety in this experiential, um, experiential process. So just to kind of summarize it, you can just sort of see that, uh, you know, if you look at the young, youngers and the olders, that basically they're moving towards um, uh, comments that are in, at these higher levels of moral development. Now what about the parents, the parenting style? Well, we, we looked at, uh, we, did, we took the kids, the 12 kids, and we divided them into um, one, two, three, four, five of them where the majority of their statements were in that stage two. So we called them the, the hedonistic kids, or the, you know, more hedonistically oriented teens, and then the others. So ignore their age, just divide them according to the kinds of statements. And then we looked at their corresponding parent, parenting style. And what we saw is that if the kid was uh, authoritative, I mean, if the kid's parent was authoritative, that's the good parenting style, um, the, uh, uh, they, were, they were in that group that was at the higher level. Whereas if they were in the authoritarian or indulgent group, um, they were, I mean, if the parent was a more authoritarian or, or indulgent, the, the kids were in the hedonistic group. So that was sort of evidence that, and again, this is consistent with other studies of parenting style and impacts, which is, you know, essentially that the children of authoritative parents um, have a tendency to be more well-rounded and more confident, more competent. So this is kind of painting a consistent picture along with that. All right, so this got our attention and it was sort of, this is really interesting, what do we do now? And that was when we shifted to planning the diary study to try to get at a more systematic picture of you know, perhaps critical incidents that could happen and responses to it and maybe more nuanced sense of how the uh, adult was, was operating, but that stalled out for a lot of reasons. And so um, we were fortunate to find, uh, to, to uh, take on this Pew data set. Okay, now the, the data set originally had, I think, over 800 
uh, responses, but we cleaned out a lot of data, or we got rid of a lot of data, we decided that the, the way it was set up was it was asking about social media, and so it would say, do you have a Facebook account? Yes, if you do, then answer these questions. Do you have a Twitter account? If, yeah. And so because Facebook was by far the most commonly used social media, we decided to just make this kind of a, a Facebook behavior study. So we only looked at um, kids who used Facebook, which was 94% of the survey respondents did. And then, of course, we only looked at data sets that had both parent and child and so on. And that's how we ended up with our final data set of 588. Now, going into this, we were working from, you know, kind of privacy scholars because this was a, really a privacy study. This wasn't online risk in general. So it was really asking questions like, you know, do you ever post stuff that you wish you hadn't posted? Do you ever, um, you know, unfriend somebody who's mean to you? Um, you know, asking questions like that in the context of Facebook. Um, and uh, uh, so we were, we were uh, starting with sort of this uh, fairly general model that you can find in the literature, which is called APCO, which stands for Antecedents, Privacy, Concern, Outcome, right? So the idea is that you've got this sort of uh, potential causal path, or at least a correlational <laughs> path between antecedents, how you feel about privacy, and then what behaviors you might exhibit with respect to privacy. And our question going in was, um, is risk experience playing a role in this, right? Is it entering into the picture like we thought we had seen in the um, interviews, right, with those critical incidents and so on? And as, uh, you know, this sort of developmental framework would suggest. So that's what we did. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that this wasn't like the easiest thing to do because we had to take these yes no questions and turn them into constructs that we could then use in our structural path models and so i didn't even know until we did this that it existed so i learned but there's something called categorical principal component analysis and so that's what we used on these yes no these dichotomous data um, so we created we essentially mined these yes-no questions for um, dimensions that were, you know, interpretable. And this is what we ended up in the kind of what we called risk-taking and risk-coping. So we came up with these names once we saw, you know, and, and made sense of the questions that, um, that came together. And so within risk-taking, there were a number of items, well, not a number, several. You know, in the paper, all of this is listed out if you're interested in the details, but um, several items having to do with what we call basic information. So this is like name, photo, personal information, but not perhaps sensitive information. And then another group that was more sensitive because it implied connectivity or uh, contact possibilities. So things like address and email and cell phone. That would be sensitive information. And then a third level was what we called risky interaction. So this was um, you know, being approached by somebody you didn't want or doing something that you wished you hadn't done, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or uh, setting, setting up your profile on some application so that anybody else using it could know exactly where you were at any point in time. Risky. So it could be risky. So those were our, our constructs for risk taking. And then we had some risk coping measures, which translated uh, as advice seeking. So do you go to somebody to ask for help when something happens or to get some sense of what to do? And also remedy. Do you, do you do something yourself if you encounter something that you're not happy with? Do you, you know, get rid of content or, um, or unfriend a person or go uh, anonymous, turn yourself into a, someone anonymous. So the, the survey also had, of course, other information that we could use more as is, like gender 
and age, and it also had some uh, Facebook usage reports and a measure of uh, the teen's privacy concern. All right, so that's what we started with. And we um, were, as I said, we're beginning with this kind of APCO model. Do these sort of antecedents uh, predict privacy concern? And does that then predict these sort of online safety related things? And well, no. That was not a very good model at all. In fact, it was a very poor model. <laughs> it was a very poor model. Um, so we did the, so it, it was a simple model, but it was a very poor model. Um, and in particular, we didn't have uh, privacy concerns predicting much in the way of risk taking or risk coping. And so we went the opposite direction, kind of threw everything in, fully saturated. and that predicted a lot, that did pretty well, but it was a mess, and so uh, we used the, we used the uh, model, you know, feedback, uh, you know, fit indicators to uh, get rid of things that weren't significant and so on. So we cleaned it up and ended up with a model. Now this is a, this is a simplified version of it. If you want to see the actual model, you can go to the paper, but I'm trying to give you a sense of it. So what, what we found was that we have gender and age that are predicting basic, they're, they're predicting basic. Do you, so you know, the older you are, the more likely you are to share your information online. Um, but what was more interesting was we saw within these three kinds of risk taking, what we characterize as a sort of escalation, right? So basic. Sharing basic information, your name, predicts sensitive. Sharing your contact information, and that in turn predicts risky interaction. So a kind of escalation in, in some sense the seriousness of the risk. And only risky interaction predicts privacy concern. So you could think that privacy concern is coming from some stuff. like. The more you use Facebook, the more you report you have a concern about privacy, right? So it is coming from some of these antecedent things, but it's also coming from risky interaction. You could say, why do you say it's coming that direction? And you just have to sort of argue the counterfactual. Is it possible that people with greater concern about their online privacy would be more likely to engage in risky interaction. And that just seems crazy. But it seems believable that if you are engaging in higher levels of risky interaction, you might have a little self-reflection. And that might influence your privacy concern. And then with respect to these risk coping uh, uh, dimensions, remember we had the kind of active thing, which was remedy, and then the more um, asking thing which was advice seeking. And risky interaction was the only thing in, in, that, um, in the risk taking that predicted the, the remedy. So it seemed like that risky interaction was having a pretty kind of dynamic effect. Like if you had been in a risky interaction, you were more likely to be coping in this more active way. Um, so again, this it's a, it's it's a bit of a complicated model. I'm, that's why I'm waving my hands. But <laughs> it's a bit of a complicated model, but it does fit with this general uh, framework that we've been working in of experiential effects of what otherwise might be seen as scary things happening, right? Some beneficial effects. So that's where we ended that that bit of it. But we didn't stop there because we also you may remember, had parent data from the Pew survey. Now the parent data asked about their concern for their teen's privacy. So it wasn't about their privacy, it was their concern about their teen's privacy. But it also asked them about things that they might have done with respect to managing their child's experiences online. Right? And we did the same, again, yes, no, a bunch of yes, no questions. So we use the same procedure to mine out 
these two constructs that we call direct intervention. And this was things like uh, you know, going into Facebook and setting the kids' privacy settings. Right? That's pretty direct. Um, or using external software to control the kinds of content that they can get to. That's pretty direct. Okay, so that's direct intervention. And then active mediation was more of uh, having discussions, um, sending emails about it, you know, so more of a communication-oriented uh, mediation. So those were the two things that came out of the, the questions that you happened to ask about mediation. And so we, look, we then investigated a very similar model to the one I just showed you, except we took out the, um, the team's uh, antecedent variables, you know, their gender and, and use of Facebook and so on, and we threw in these parental variables. And what we found, of course, was, you know, we rep you know of course we replicated the parts of the model that were the same, uh, in, the, in the previous one I showed you. But with respect to the parental variables, we saw that their concern for their teen's privacy um, is positively linked to the extent to which they do either kind of mediation, okay? So it's, it's positively predicting direct and active um, intervention, or direct intervention and active mediation. Um, and it also predicts teen concern. So if I'm worried about my teen's online privacy, chances are my teen is also worried about his or her online privacy. Could go either way, but they're related. Um, but the, the, the other impacts of strategy, which is type, the types of mediation, were, were, were um, complex. So it wasn't simple to summarize them but I've summarized them here for you. <laughs> so direct intervention, that's setting controls and so on, was positive for a certain kind of coping, which was advice seeking, but it was negative for the other one, the more active type of coping, which was you know, confronting or removing content or taking some action. Um, active mediation was positive for that kind of thing. Okay, so it's suggesting, like we saw in the uh, interview study that we coded uh, with parenting style, it's suggesting differential impacts, perhaps, of these two different uh, aspects of things, or these two different kinds of things that parents can do. And of course, parents can do both kinds of things. So it's, it's really just showing that they may be having differential kinds of impacts in the development. And so this. This tries to get at it a little bit differently, so let's do a median split on, um, on mediation strategies and on, um, yeah, on, on the two different kinds of mediation strategies. So here we have low, low, high, low, low, high, high, low, high, high. And what you see here is that what's being graphed is the, um, the frequency of being online, in this case, using Facebook, because these were all about Facebook usage. Um, and what you see is that the parents who were high in the direct thing, that's controlling the settings and so on, but low in the active, had kids who were online the least, right? So they were getting less exposure to anything that might be there. And the people, the, the parents who were low in the direct, so not likely to be using the controls, but high in the active, engaging in discussion and so on, had the kids who were online the most. And so it's sort of, you know, again, expanding the picture to suggest that different sorts of parenting strategies may lead to different types of, you could say, experience opportunities for the children, right? And so the question is, uh, if the teen isn't allowed to go online a lot, or feels that he or she shouldn't go online, or when they do go online, they can't ex uh, explore in a very broad way, are they slowed, right? Do they develop more slowly um, their, their sensibility and their ability to deal with possibly risky content? So that's where we ended up in the Pew data 
And now we were ready. Ah, oh, again, again. Oh, no fair. All right, I did it before. I can do it again. <laughs> Man, no fair. All right, let's see. I don't have. Where's my Where's my mouse? It's over there. It's not here. So I'll just have to go through. Okay, sorry guys. Oh. It's just a review. Yeah, just a review, in case you didn't get that the first time. Boop, boop, boop. There we are. Okay, here we are. So now we want to start to look at uh, an explanatory mechanism. Again, drawing from developmental, uh, you know, sort of family development literature. And so we began drawing from resilience theory, or the theory of resilience which we really like, because resilience is a great concept. And it's been used a lot to explain things like, uh, you know, teens' responses to, uh, or, or tendency towards drug addiction, or, uh, you know, sex abuse, or all kinds of risky stuff. But it hadn't been used, at least we could find no evidence of it being used, to really try to account for these kinds of phenomena that we were looking at. So. Uh, so the point is, resilience is something that helps you get through tough times, right? That's, you know, an informal definition of what we mean by resilience. But you don't get resilience just by being there. You learn resilience. So resilience is the result of something. You know, it's not poured into your brain by your parent. You might get it by modeling. So you could get it by modeling. But you also can get it, presumably, through experiential learning. Um, you survive, right? And you become more uh, resilient. So, so we had this view of this kind of protective model, which is one of the things that's talked about in this Stevenson and, and Zimmerman, who are the, these theorists that we were drawing from, where resilience could be what's called a promotive factor that enters in and sort of reduces or minimizes the negative impacts of these risk exposures, right? So you don't feel as bad afterwards if somebody bullies you or shows you a nasty picture because you're more resilient. That's the, that's the concept. And so we designed an instrument with this in mind. And this is the instrument that we used a version of as part of the pre post in the diary study, but we also have a bunch of data that we collected um, using a Qualtrics panel. That's the part I'm not going to, we haven't analyzed yet. Um, but here is the survey. So three of these things are very well established scales from the literature um, that are useful in this context. One is negative affect, has nothing to do per se with online, so it's not tied to online negative affect. It's just, do you feel bad, basically? So if you're taking a survey, you go through and you say, do you feel anxious? You go through this whole set of items that together give a sense of what's your state of mind with respect to negativity. Um, the uh, resilience we got from the literature, a nice validated scale, internet addiction is I hate that word, internet addiction, but it's basically, you know, that you have to use the internet or you will die. You know, it's, it's questions that are getting at that. So it's called addiction, but, you know, they read you know, kind of a dependence. I really need my internet today. Um, so those are the ones we took from the literature, and then we developed 16 items to look at different kinds of online risk. In this, you're going to just see online risk all together. but. It consists of four uh, subscales, one for information breaches, so this is kind of the privacy side of things, one for online harassment, one for sexual solicitations, and one for exposure to explicit content. So these were uh, constructs that we drew kind of from the literature. People had been talking and studying these issues, and so we wanted to measure those, and those are the possible risk events that teens reported on in the diary study. So this is you know, kind of all tying together eventually. 
But here, we just use them as a single uh, construct for online risk. All right, so the first thing I can show you is that, you know, as you might expect, people who are more addicted to the internet and presumably spend a lot more time <laughs> using it um, uh, have poorer mental states, more negative mental states. This is replicating what's been found in the past. So other people have reported this kind of thing. But what we also then added to that is this mediating effect of online risk, risk exposure. So the higher they were, and you know, we just put all those categories together, the higher they were in their report of these online risks, um, the more they also the more that uh, internet addiction added to negative effect. So it sort of um, helps to explain that the, uh, you know, it's not just frequent use, right, or internet addiction that's making you feel bad. It's that something that goes along with it, like this uh, higher risk exposure, is also contributing to that. So that's the starting point. But then when it really gets interesting when we throw in the resilience, because we had predicted, you probably can't remember now, but we had predicted that the effect would be largely here, that resilience would help you deal with the online risk exposure. So you wouldn't be as affected by it. But we actually found out that it jumped in at both stages. So it also reduced the, um, not, disappeared, but reduced the tendency of internet addiction to be predicting levels of online risk exposure. So it brought down such that, you know, if you're resilient, you're less likely to experience online risk, <coughs> even though you have high levels of internet addiction. And if you do, then you're less likely to have this negative effect. And so that was pretty cool. Um, and here's just another view of it. I mean, it's, it's cool just, I mean, it's not surprising so much, but it's nice that, you know, when you go to all this trouble and it comes out the way you thought it should. So here's a, a view using this kind of, you know, median split of the, of the groups and so on so that you can see these interactions that we're talking about. So here is the relationship of risk exposure and negative affect that's coming down on the, the right side of that uh, uh, graph that I showed you just before. And you see that for uh, people who are in the high resilience uh, half of the median split, um, basically they are not showing that impact of high risk exposure <coughs> on negative impact, on, on negative affect, but those in the low are showing it big time. And then the other side is looking at the interaction between internet addiction and risk exposure. And it's not as strong, but it's showing you uh, that if you're in the low resilience group, the high internet addiction is much, you know, puts you much higher in terms of risk exposure. So that's suggesting that this resilience construct is both perhaps helping teens to avoid or prepare for risk exposure so that maybe they're not felt so much as risk exposures, um, as well as deal with any negative repercussions of it. All right, so that's all I'm really going to tell you. Um, this is a work still in progress, um, but what I've shown you is, is, you know, work that is telling you this, this story that teens' exposure to online risk is not all bad, that we need to understand the upside of it, that this is how they're going to develop it, maybe how they become resilient, is being exposed to and surviving those online risks. And that for parents, the tendency is to protect, and the easiest way to do that is to control, and that may be fine for very young, and maybe even into the early teens, but um, that active mediation is going to be probably a much more effective approach as the, as the teen grows older and tries to 
move away from you. Um, now we haven't, you know, had a chance to really look at the diary data well and, you know, link it with the parent, you know, the parent and child stuff. But, you know, we've started doing that and, and uh, there's a lot more to do. Um, in terms of um, what should we do? Well, at, you know, it's, it's sort of obvious. It's sort of, you know, make it easier for teens to sort of safely try out these risk experiences. Exactly how? That's a lot harder to say. <laughs> but, you know, certainly we can think about introducing teens to this notion of escalation. You know, you start by just giving your name and before you know it, you know, somebody's sending you really nasty grams. Um, but make available opportunities to, you know, maybe get advice or confront or, you know, delete content. You know, really think about those and make them easy and obvious in the user interface. Or, or maybe game-based <coughs> learning, you know, role-playing and that kind of stuff that appeals to young people where somehow they get credit, you know, for, for you know, confronting their, their, uh, their risks and surviving and so on. So there might be some motivational techniques. And with that, I know I took too long, so I say thank you. And of course, thanks to everybody else who did a lot of this work. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a few questions, and we'd like to use the mic for questions so that it gets on the uh, video recording and everybody in the room can hear. And Alfred, all you have the first crack. Great talk. Thanks, uh, Can you show again the large structural model? You mean the one that I was waving the my hand? Hand waving, yeah. yeah. The hand exactly. waving one? Yeah. yeah. There you go. A few quick questions on that. Uh, Gender is generally uh, regarded as having an impact yeah. on risk taking, so boys take on their risk. Right. Why is, uh, do you have an explanation where it, uh, It's age, yeah. Um, so I think that in this, yeah, I mean, gender was associated with risk coping strategies and it was girls. Well, it's, it's it was girls. Take. It was girls. Okay. Not, okay. yeah, not, yeah. Okay. it wasn't the boys, yeah. it was the girls who were more likely to have, to have reported yes to these remedies and advice getting. Okay. Yeah. And can you show the small, uh, what, this, this structure, one? no, the mediation effect oh, okay. of, of what you call resilience? Yeah. In the light of the fact uh, that uh, there is Oh, okay. assume it. In, in, in these, yeah, yeah these, are in, these are no longer significant in the presence of resilience. That's why they became dotted. Yeah. yeah. But the resilience has a positive uh, mediating effect on online <coughs> risk exposure. This, Is that right? The, no, no. no uh, in, resilience has, it interacts, so it's got this kind of depressing effect okay. of this relationship. So it reduces the strength of internet addiction on risk exposure. But it's still there. It's still there, but the other one, it gets rid of it. It disappears. And the main effect of internet addiction on negative affect also goes away in the presence of resilience. Okay, other questions? Thank you. Um, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the very first thing you did with mm -hmm. the Colbert work. Yeah. Um, because it was interesting to me that you saw this very strong connection between parenting style and a particular developmental stage since so many kids go through most, if not all, of these stages. Right. I'm wondering if you could right. talk about that more. Right. Yeah, I think we, I mean, you know, to be honest, this was very exploratory and we were a bit surprised when we saw this because it looks pretty, you know, pretty, you know, even though it's a small sample, it looks pretty um, clear, right? Um, that the, the kids who, and again, remember how we did this, these are kids who are giving majority stage two or these hedonistic, so it's not really fair to say these are the hedonistic kids and the non-hedonistic kids. That's a, you know, that's a, that's cheating, really, but um, but they had them. They were different in that way, and so the fact that it came out 
that the authoritarian and the indulgent uh, were the ones that had those kinds of kids suggested mostly that those kids were probably not progressing through development. I'm getting too close to that microphone. <laughs> Squeak! <laughs> Um, we're not progressing through the stages as quickly, right? That's what it suggested to us. And the parents who had this more balanced approach, yes, my expectations are clear, but yes, I'm with you. I'm in your camp. That's the responsiveness that their kids were progressing more quickly. So that was, you know, to the extent we interpreted it, that's how we... Yeah. Will, you, will your ongoing work look at this in more detail? Or well, it, we will have a range. So our dyad study has a similar range of ages, and it has you know similar kinds of measures in it. So we will be able to look at it, and over you know we're not exactly sure how we'll do that yoke, yoking mm -hmm. analysis, but we'll definitely be look like we've looked at you know simple things like. Do the kids and the parents report the same thing? No. You know, the kids report a lot more than the parents. So the parents don't know what's going on a lot of the time. But the, but the, but the serious things do tend to show up. But, but we haven't really crystallized a lot of that. Okay. Question over here. Thanks for the talk. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a question about the resilience. Um, I was wondering if it might be correlated with some sort of internet savviness type of thing, and if that might also have a mediating effect between the mm -hmm. internet addiction and um, the exposure to risky it's, uh, content. It's, it's, it's possible, but yeah, so internet addiction is more of a dependence, and I don't know, maybe somebody else knows whether there's other correlations of internet addiction with things like savviness. I mean, you, you have a tendency at least sometimes, to think that the more you use something, the you know, the more you learn about it. But you're talking about something else, maybe. Uh, I, I was wondering, though, is resilience though correlated with um, with the, internet addiction? Yeah, with internet savviness. Is, or is we didn't like, measure internet savviness. Right. Oh, and you just mean is it in the literature correlated? Yeah, I just wonder if that might also have an effect. Like if you you tend to be more resilient. Yeah. But you're also a bit more savvy. Right. Than that's right. And that, and it, I, I, I can't speak to that in, in these data, but we did have a, um, a, a little uh, tickler in the interview study because there was all, you know, I talked about parenting style, but there also seemed to be some indication of the parents' tech internet savviness, right? So the ones who were less savvy had kids who were more hedonistic, you know? You could say taking advantage of their parents not knowing anything, kind of. <laughs> I mean, that's that's one way to think about it. But we couldn't really test that, you know. It's it, you know it's drawn from like a couple of statements from some hedonistic kid. <laughs> questions? Any more questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. A really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, I think you uh, mentioned something on the first, uh, um, your the smaller uh, data set study, mm -hmm. got like 12. Uh, the first interview yeah, study. 12, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you mentioned there's 11 in the parents. The mom. Yes, we're moms, uh, yeah. And then the Pew study, it used to work peer the uh, parents. Uh, do you mean like the parents peer with the children? Or was that actually, you got both? Yeah, it was, it was their, their own parent. Yeah, but like, do you have parent. both father and mother? No, 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 no. Sorry, it was just one. It was just one. And I think I, I don't know the answer. You're, you're going to ask. Was it also, you know, eleven out of twelve mothers? I'm sure it was mostly mothers. Mm -hmm. I'm. Do you remember, Jack, whether they even gathered the parent gender? I don't think. I don't okay. think they did. Yeah. You know, I never saw it. Okay, they okay. did. I thought I heard it. You mentioned like eleven mothers. No, that was in the that was in the diary study. Oh, just one because I was. Just thinking like if uh, and not the diary, like the interview the, study. The parents, so actually, the father, mother, and the child, so actually three yes. people. Yes. Yes. They, yeah, they yeah. might like a different parent might come yeah. something yeah. different. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's a that's a weakness mm -hmm. of the methods that we've been using. That we're not looking at the full uh, family system. And we're not looking at siblings either, yeah. especially like older sisters or older brothers would also be part of a full family system. So we took one tiny step into family systems approach, and it was hard. <laughs> Thank you. 
Can we take one more question? Anybody? Okay, well, Thank you. following our usual tradition, we have a reception awaiting you downstairs on the fifth floor. And again, uh, go down there first, and then let Mary Beth come down and, uh, <laughs> and engage. And, and receive me there. appropriately. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you again. Thank for your you. Great